Hello, everybody. I am Professor Juan de Dios Incunegui, Director of the International Center of Parliamentary Studies, Research and Prospective from the School of Government of Universidad Austral, Argentina. I'm chairing this workshop today. Good afternoon to our audience here in Berlin, Germany, at the World Health Summit 2022. Hello also to those participating remotely. Dear Honorable Ricardo Baptista Leite, Founder and President of UNITE, dear Honorable Liam Barne, President of Parnet, uh, dear Dr. Roland Gude, Chairman of the Board of the German Health Alliance, distinguished speakers and participants. We are opening today the workshop dedicated to analyzing a critical, strategic, and urgent topic, the role of parliamentarians in the development of a global pandemic, pandemic treaty. I'm sure you will find this exchange of scientific and institutional debate, analysis, and decision-making highly relevant and feasible to impact the future world well and better prepared for prevent and manage pandemics. As you know perfectly, one of the more valuable and unique aspects of this particular panel is the fact that being focused on the role of parliamentarians and parliaments, one of the most relevant actors to warranty a broad, open, diverse, and transparent debate which conducts to the adoption of a future global pandemic treaty, the parliamentary oversight of its implementation and the assignment of proper funding. Let me introduce to the honorable parliamentarians here to my left. I'm so sorry. I will introduce them properly in their panel. Um, now, next we invite to the pulpit to Roland Gude to address the welcome words to the audience. Additionally, to chair the board of the German Health Alliance, Roland is co-founder and CEO of the newly established Bilcho Foundation for Global Health, awarding the Bilcho Prize for Global Health for the first time this year. He is also the senior managing director of the German diagnostics company Sysmex Partech. Uh, Mr. Gude, the floor is yours. You have four minutes. Thank you very much. Yeah, dear Chair, Professor Singune, esteemed members of Parliament, dear Ricardo, dear Dr. Jaoud Majur, Assistant Director General of WHO, distinguished panelists and representatives of international and civil society organizations, dear participants, it's a privilege and pleasure to welcome you to this highly important session on the role of parliamentarians in the development of a global pandemic treaty hosted by the International Forum on Global Health. I'm very grateful to have been kindly invited to give this welcome note on behalf of GHA, with its 120 member organizations from all sectors, we focus on health system strengthening since years working closely together with highly esteemed partners like UNITE, UNAIDS, and other international organizations. Developing an international instrument on pandemics was first proposed by European Council President Charles Michel at the Paris Peace Forum in November 2020. And a year ago, precisely at the World Health Summit 2021, Michel presented that he had proposed, together with WHO Director General Dr. Tedros, an international treaty on pandemics rooted in the WHO Constitution. More than 110 countries supported the decision to launch negotiations for a WHO convention, agreement, or other international instrument. At the special session of World Health Assembly in December 2021, the historic decision was then reached to launch the process to develop and negotiate a global agreement on pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response. Next year, at the 76th WHA progress report will be delivered by the Intergovernmental Negotiation Body. In May 2024, the proposed instrument will be presented for adoption by the 77th World Health Assembly, thus involving delegations of 194 WHO member countries, while civil society, international organizations, and other agencies are being broadly consulted. The strong global mandate underlines that WHO as most inclusive and most experienced international body is, of course, undoubtedly predestined in, the, predestined in this context. All 17 SDGs are relevant to health. They are all influenced by health. The corona pandemic has dramatically demonstrated this at global scale. Under this magnifying glass, the extent to which health and efficient health systems are directly interrelated with society, politics, economy, climate, and nutrition, overall with stability and peace, was brought into even much more sharper focus. With a role and responsibility, parliamentarians are both at the center of the processes at the very specific pillars that provide healthcare, justice, equity, economic support, education, and others. And at the intersections, overlaps, and areas of interconnection and interaction. 
More than ever before, political leadership thus needs to focus on systemic strategies from holistic perspectives while shaping with maximum transparency the corresponding policies and mechanisms and securing financing, all embedded within the right and appropriate legislation. Exactly for this reason, establishing the, establishing the International Forum on Global Health, a dedicated working group from 12 diverse international parliamentary assemblies and networks worldwide, can only be seen and embraced as a truly very significant milestone. And I would like to especially commend you, my dear friend Ricardo, for your unparalleled and successful leadership also in this absolutely crucial achievement. And the next milestone is already ahead of us tomorrow. Call your congratulations to WHO and um, unite to sign an MOU during this World Health Summit. To make the entire nexus of the different health-related pillars functioning as successfully as required to address the immense, much increasing global challenges caused by the current superimposition of various dramatic crises, and to achieve more dynamic success working toward the health-related UN SDGs, sufficient and well-targeted, effective and efficient financing will be key. And as last argument in my brief welcome note, a critical prerequisite for this fundamentally important budgetary decisions that parliamentarians must take in this respect also related to pandemic treaty is the development of common health metrics as proposed to G20. This common health metrics is required to assess at all levels health investments measure their impact on economic growth, societal well-being, and on ensuring the resilience of the health and financial systems, thus serving as key tool and driver to achieve health-related UN SDGs. And if we tell health is not a cost, it's investment, we need this scientifically based um, um, data as, uh, as really reliable and sound argument. And as you, Ricardo, like to phrase it, SDGs continue to be the beacon that leads the way towards 2030. I would like to add that you as parliamentarians and the voices of the people you represent, plus the right framework for SDG 70, 17 partnerships for the goals, are the igniting and burning fire of this beacon. Therefore, we all at highest level commend the responsibility and action you as parliamentarians have taken to jointly unite towards making this beacon as strong as only possible. Now wishing all of us a most inspiring, fruitful and insightful session. Thank you so much for your very kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gude, for such uh, powerful words. We now invite uh, to the Honorable Ricardo Baptista Leite and Liam Byrne to the pulpit, one at a time. I think you, you all know him. Uh, Ricardo is a member of the Portuguese National Parliament in his uh, fourth term, Vice President of the Social Democratic Party Parliamentary Board, Head of Public Health at the Catholic University of Portugal, Founding President of UNITE, Parliamentarians Network for Global Health, Vice President of the Global Parliamentary Network on the World Bank and IMF, uh, may Mayoral Candidate and City Councilor of Sintra since last year, it's a stent uh, bio. And Ricardo has postgraduate studies in different universities, including John Hopkins, Harvard Kennedy School of Government and Harvard Medical School. He is a PhD candidate at Maastricht University. Ricardo is the main author of the book, A Road to a Cure, Reforming the National Health System, among other publications. Okay, please, your turn. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Juan de Dios. That was an extensive presentation. I wasn't expecting that. Um, uh, uh, dear, uh, dear assistant uh, to the Director General of the WHO, uh, Dr. Yawud Manjur, uh, my dear friends, Roland Gu, uh, for your kind words, thank you. Uh, Liam, thank you for coming all the way. Uh, my esteemed uh, colleagues and friends from uh, UNITE, members of parliament from around the world, uh, both here at front, but also within our audience, uh, they are much more interesting to listen to than I am, so I'm going to keep it brief, but as president and founder of the Unite Parliamentarians Network for Global Health, they make me do these introductory uh, speeches. Um, last year, uh, Unite, Parliamentarians Network for Global Health, actually joined forces with the Parliamentary Network for, uh, of the World Bank and IMF, of which uh, Liam Byrne, the Honorable Liam Byrne is uh, the chair. I'm his vice chair in that network. Uh, we joined forces of our two networks to create an organization we are very proud of, and it's still in its baby steps, but it's growing for creating the International Forum for Global Health. It's truly a federation of 12 national, uh, international uh, parliamentary networks and assemblies that have come together with a common goal of bringing the health, but also the economy agenda together, understanding that health is a prerequisite 
for development to achieve all of the 17 sustainable development goals and to achieve something that Liam always likes to, to discuss, which is the importance of inclusive growth to be able to achieve the well being of all people. We were able to unite members from different countries, gather to make sure that we indeed have a health in all policies uh, approach, focusing on three pillars prevention, not just preventing a future pandemic, but also. Understand, underlying the, inter, the importance of uh, prevention, moving away from disease systems towards creating ecosystems for the well being, health system strengthening as a second pillar, and the third pillar, making sure that the voice of patients are heard, making sure that human rights and health are put at the center of the agenda, making sure that access is a reality, not just for some, but for all. And today, here in the presence of the chair of the parliamentary network, uh, on the World Bank and IMF, uh, Liam Byrne. We are here to discuss the new global health architecture and counting also on the support of the German Health Alliance. And Roland Gru is here representing precisely that alliance and showing the importance, as you said, of SDG 17, that beacon, uh, pushing forward the SDGs uh, for through partnerships. And if all private partners around the world were like you, Roland, we would have a better world. I have no doubt about that. And thank you for co-organizing this session. Dear colleagues, we are facing challenging times from the COVID-19 pandemic to the conflict in Ukraine and so many armed conflicts that are still ongoing around the world. We have experienced the best, but also the worst of humanity. As parliamentarians, we need to stand united to ensure that we can prevent the next pandemic and to protect the ones that we as representatives serve, the people, to ensure that we uh, have policies that are built with strong scientific evidence-based data. We cannot deal with health threats as if countries were isolated, as if countries were islands. And we need to address one country's health threat as a threat to us all. And therefore, it is our responsibilities to do so in each of our countries, in each of our re uh, regions. It is our obligation to the people that we serve, not only making sure that we are the voice of the people, but we actually create conditions so that we can be, give the voice to the people. So we need to do better. And we have an opportunity to do so as parliamentarians, as we are the ones responsible for pushing for new laws, for new policies, for reallocating budgets, but also keeping governments accountable. And this is so important that we make sure that international commitments signed on, for example, at the World Health Assembly are not forgotten throughout the year, that they are transformed into reality. As we are still responding to the pandemic and hopefully start to see the end of it, we need to plan for the future. Now that the global health architecture is being discussed, parliamentarians such as the ones present here have the opportunity to share the experiences from COVID-19 to help the World Health Organization to reach a mechanism that is both effective and useful. And we have a critical role as members of parliaments, congresses and senates to in the development of a global treaty convention, a legal binding document that makes sure that we are more capable to prevent pre and prepare to respond to future pandemic threats uh, uh, that may come. And members of our network, as members of our network, we have the responsibilities truly to be the leaders in the forefront of these global health challenges to make sure that no one is left behind. Normally I end my speeches saying, um, it's time to unite, but today I want to ask for your help. I'm going to say it's time to, and I want everyone here to say unite. It's time to, uh, there you go. Thank you very much. Let me introduce to Liam Byrne uh, briefly. He's honorable member of the British Parliament at, at the House of Commons, uh, chair of the Global Parliamentary Network on the World Bank and IMF. Before entering politics, Liam was a Fulbright Scholar at the Harvard Business School and a technology entrepreneur. In 2004, he gave up a successful business career to serve one of the poorest communities in Britain, uh, his constituency of Hodge Hill in East Birmingham, where five generations of his family lived and worked. 
Uh, he has doubled his majority at every election. Congratulations. <laughs> Liam is the author of Black Flag Down Counter Extremism, Beating ISIS and Winning the Battle of Ideas and Dragons, 10 Entrepreneurs Who Built Britain, both from 2016 and Turning to Face the East, published in 2013. Uh, Honorable Brian, your turn. Uh, well, Professor, uh, my dear friend Ricardo, uh, friends from around the world, it's a huge pleasure and a privilege to be here. Uh, as many of you uh, in this room know, uh, that when Ricardo asks you to do something, you basically have to say yes. Uh, but it's, it's a huge privilege and an honor for me to be here today, both to salute Ricardo's leadership on this, but more importantly, to help spread the message about what Unite is trying to do around the world. Over the last two to three years, if there is one lesson that we have learned in politics, if there's one lesson that we've learned in social policy, if there's one lesson we've learned in global health, it is that pandemics do not stop at passport control. As Ricardo said, truly, none of us in this world are an island, and that is why we have to unite to tackle great global public threats, as well as work on great global public goods. Last week in Washington at the annual meetings of the IMF and the World Bank, we set out the challenge for countries now around the world. It is the challenge of food and fragility and finance. Think about the fragility that now besets the security of millions of global citizens now. 41 countries now face uh, a threat of civil war uh, and conflict and violence that now means the number of people living in conflict zones has doubled in the last 10 to 15 years. What that means is that we now have something like 20 million refugees around the world living in the most unspeakable conditions. Think about the conflict that now besets those in the Sahel, in Ethiopia, in Somalia, in Lebanon. Think of the religious violence that we now see in Myanmar. We now have a crisis of fragility that is threatening people around the world. But that is not the only crisis because as countries came out of COVID with debts high and we now face the rise in American interest rates, we now have something like 40 to 50 countries now facing debt distress. So the challenge that we face is going up and our capacity to act is now going down. And then put on top of that, the challenge of the food crisis that is now confronting hundreds of millions of people around the world with the threat of starvation. At last week's annual meetings in Washington, we brought together parliamentarians from around the world, but in particular, parliamentarians from across Africa, like Nima from Tanzania and many of her colleagues, and parliamentarians from places like Ghana and from Uganda. The story that we now hear is that after millennia of being able to predict the seasons, actually, we can't predict the seasons anymore. When the rain comes, it now comes with such force that it doesn't bring life, it brings death. The sun that rises every morning now brings death, not life. We now face a crisis of famine and food insecurity that threatens the lives of 205 million people. 3.1 billion people now do not have enough money to afford a good diet. 11 million people now die each day because they cannot afford the nutrition that they need. So when you put all of that together, the risks are really clear. We now have costs which are high and security and immunity, which is low. And so we have to be so careful today that we don't get caught in a vicious cycle of how a pandemic of disease triggers a pandemic of poverty, which in turn triggers future pandemics of disease in the years to come. That is why this initiative is so important and so timely. Now, the second big thing that we have learned from the crisis of the last few years is that they're incredibly expensive. Prevention is always better than cure, always better than cure. But now think of the economic costs which are unfolding around the world. Last week, the IMF estimated that COVID is now due to cost the global economy 12.5 trillion dollars through to the end of 2024. It has already triggered 
an infection of inflation around the world. It is now triggering higher interest rates, which in turn are slowing global growth um, next year. So we know that the risk is high. We know that immunity is low. We know that prevention is better than cure. So what do we do as parliamentarians? Just sit back and hope it doesn't happen again? That would be a fool's counsel. What we have got to do is to get behind the kind of initiative that Ricardo has set out with such force and passion and energy over the last year or two, and actually make sure that from the bottom up, we insist as representatives of the families of 6.5 million people who lost their lives in this pandemic, that this never happens again. And that is why, friends, that is why the greatest testament that we can give to those that we have loved and lost is to salute their memory and honor their memory by taking the steps that are needed to ensure there is no repeat of what happened. There is an English uh, philosopher called Thomas Hobbes who wrote a, a couple of good books um, that they teach you in political science at undergrad. Um, but one quote that he gave us is the quote that, that always stands out to me as a politician. Hell is the truth seen too late. Well, we have been through hell. We have seen what it looks like. So it, our duty, our responsibility, our determination is to make damn sure it doesn't happen again. And that is why this initiative today is so important. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo and Liam, uh, for your words and your call. Uh, let's start with the different panels of the workshop. The first one is new global health architecture, global pandemic treaty, an essential tool to build back better. The first, uh, sorry, I, I invite uh, Dr. Shawat Makshur to the panel to address the audience from the pulpit. Yeah, here, I'm going to introduce you. Dr. Jawad Mahul has been appointed as Assistant Director General of the Emergency Preparedness Division within the World Health Organization's Emergency Program as of 15 March 2019. Most recently, he served as the Director of WHO's Country Health Emergency Preparedness and International Health Regulations Department and National of Morocco. Dr. Mahoujour is a public health specialist with over 30 years of experience in designing, implementing, and evaluating diseases control programs at national and international levels. He joined the World Health Organization at the country as a country representative to Lebanon in 2005. In 2007, he took the position of director, communicable diseases control in the WHO Eastern Mediterranean Regional Office. Okay, it's very long also. Prior to joining WHO, Dr. Mahjur was the director of Epidemiology and Diseases Control in the Ministry of Health of Morocco. It's a true honor to introduce you. Uh, you have, um, it's your turn, sir, doctor. Thank you very much. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. The only thing that we can keep from this introduction is an um, old man who will be who will be retiring very soon. No, I um, really it is is really uh, very difficult and challenging to speak uh, after so eloquent speakers who put the scene and who really responded to the question of our panel uh, on the role of the parliamentarian. I would like only to add one thing. Uh, and on on uh, related to the international agreement that they are discussed now among member states is when this agreement will be uh, adopted globally then the ratification process will start and this is where your role it became more important comparing to the global discussion because during the ratification this is where uh, the parliament will hear all stakeholders at the country level civil society communities, uh, members of the government, industry, and also private sector. And I think personally this process is extremely important to bring political commenting around prevention, preparedness, uh, and emergency preparedness. And again, thank you very much for this opportunity, and I will try very quickly to update you on where member states are in uh, discussing this very important topic and give you some a quick update. I think uh, 
this pandemic was uh, exceptional in its nature, comparing to the previous uh, uh, health crisis that we had. SARS, H1N1 in 2009, Ebola 14, Ebola 18. This one was big in its scale, big in its consequences, and uh, also uh, the consequence went beyond the health sector, affecting economy, affecting education, climate, and if everything. And this is why member state of a uh, member of WHO came together to say, okay, let us commit, let us join our effort to make sure that this will never happen again. And uh, this is why uh, uh, we are here all together. During the COVID-19, uh, many panels met and uh, give recommendation. And uh, maybe I will mention here several of these panels who came up with set recommendation and give advice how to improve our preparedness and response to pandemic. The IPPR, the, uh, the IHR review committee, the uh, GPMB and others. Uh, we collected more than 300 recommendations from all these panels who are all aiming to prevent and prepare better for the next pandemic. And based on this recommendation, the director general came up with a new uh, vision that we call architecture, global architecture for health emergency preparedness. And this architecture is based on three pillars, three major pillars, and he proposed 10 proposals to build better. And you, this document is available in our website. The three pillars is one, first one is governance. We need better governance to plan, to uh, prevent, and also to come together when something happened. And this, uh, uh, this pillar is based on uh, stronger leadership at the global level, at national level, more accountability, and uh, then Barbara Stokin uh, can speak about much better than I do on accountability and enforcement of international treaties, and of course, improving uh, regulation. And this is where, under which the, the, the treaty or the international agreement and the revision of the IHR, the international health regulation are discussed. The second pillar is to establish systems and tools to bring more capacity at the country level, more coordination and more collaboration. And he allow me to just mention one thing about country preparedness. For a long time, we considered that country preparedness is something that countries may do or not do. But after the COVID, we understood that there is no global preparedness without country preparedness. Country preparedness should be seen at the center of any global preparedness. Because if we, if one country remains not prepared, the whole world is not prepared. And when you look to the country, and this is which your role became extremely important, we very often have good indicator of the national preparedness. But when you look to the sub-national level and the community level, things are big, are, there's big differences. And if a community remain not prepared, the world is not prepared. Pandemic start in a community, doesn't start in, in the capital, doesn't start in, in Geneva. Everything starts at the community and at the, and the community. This is why after the COVID, there is big mind shift in looking to the preparedness. Second issue on, on national preparedness is that having capacities is not enough. This capacity should be tested regularly and maintained. And uh, we saw it in, 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 in the COVID, uh, countries that were scored very high in the level of preparedness, when COVID started, their health system literally collapsed because they were not resilient enough, because they were not tested enough. And the capacity they're not sustained to be kept when we need them. And this new way of thinking that collectively we need to consider while we are uh, discussing. The third one is financing. And of course, financing is extremely important through national and domestic financing and the parliamentary have a role in this to make sure that in the budget, there is dedicated financing for country preparedness. Of course, some countries cannot afford because of the, uh, of their income. And here, the international solidarity should come and help these countries to be prepared. Keeping in mind that helping country to be prepared is not aid, it's an investment. When you, when you support country A, you are first preparing the, the globe, 
Second, you are protecting your country because anything that's happening in this country can affect you. And if we come with this new approach, I'm sure that uh, we will be much better for, uh, prepared for the next one. Of course, this architecture aim to uh, first to increase alert, increase detection and respond at and, and, uh, and the right time. This is why member states, as I said in the beginning, agreed now to lead two processes who are in parallel, but complementing each other. The first one is the revision of the International Health Regulation 2005. All of you are familiar with these regulations who are uh, were adopted in 2005 to look to the spread of diseases. This, uh, the, this regulation were adopted immediately after the SARS. And this regulation uh, during the COVID shows some limitation in their uh, applicability. And one of the, uh, the, the, the weaknesses of the health regulation is one, when the director general declare a public health event with international concern, which is the highest alert uh, in terms of uh, communicable disease spread, when he issue a recommendation to countries, these recommendations are not legally binding to countries. When the DG said, after consulting group of experts, that, for example, there is no need for travel restriction, the second day, all countries or many countries close borders. And this is one, one of the things that member states may look when they revise the IHR. So far, we have 14 countries who propose amendment to the IHR, and the director regional established group of experts that is mandated to look all these 14 amendments and come up with one set of amendments to be proposed to the member state to be discussed. And the negotiation of the IHR will be uh, will start in January next year, and it will take one year. And it's a big challenge. Many uh, of you will say that's mission impossible, and uh, but the uh, same for the international agreement, by the way. Uh, we just... Uh, uh, we remind everyone who said this short notice to remind them that the WHO constitution was discussed and approved in six months. And when the member states want, want to come together and decide they can do miracles, and this is what we are uh, hoping. On the second track is what we are here for today is the international agreement on uh, uh, pandemic prevention, uh, uh, preparedness and response as uh, these dis distinguished uh, speakers before me uh, put the scene of it, uh, the member state established an interna international uh, negotiation body that started its work in February uh, this year. And they came up to uh, an agreement last July on under which article this uh, instrument will be negotiated. Just to, for reminder, to remind you, that in WHO constitution, there is three articles where we can have a, a, an international instrument. Article 19, which give broad scope of negotiation. And uh, the scope is the definition of health in under constitution. Article 21 is about regulation with limited scope to spread of the disease. This is where the IHR was adopted. And article 23, which is an article that uh, uh, issue recommendation while not legally binding. Last July, member states collectively, the 194 agreed that the next instrument should be legally binding and should be negotiated under Article 19 to give a broader scope to, uh, to the member state to include issues who cannot be accommodated uh, under Article 21, which is limited scope. But also they kept uh, uh, the door open for uh, to use the Article 21 in some element of the treaty, which is by itself, I think, a strong consensus for the for the start of for the negotiation. As you know very well, the INB is led with the with the bureau representing the six region WHO regions. And the coaches are uh, Dr. Precious Matsutsu from South Africa, uh, Mr. Roland Dries from Netherlands, and the four vice chairs are Ambassador Tobar from Brazil, Ahmed Salama from Egypt. Dr. Viruj from Thailand and Dr. Kazu from Japan. And, and this, this uh, bureau now is requested based on the July decision 
to present in INB3 in the third meeting in beginning of December, a new draft of, uh, of, the, of the, the paper that was discussed in July, uh, literally having a bridge between informal discussion that happened so far and the zero draft that member state will start negotiating in, in next February. And this is why uh, what member, what the Bureau are doing this, the, the, this time, and they will propose this, this, uh, this to the INB uh, in December. But if you look to the paper that is already not approved, but member state consider good background for, for continuing their work, this paper established the vision of, of the, the, the instrument and the vision is to protect pre and prevent future generation from devastating consequences of pandemic. The, also this paper set up a set of principle uh, uh, that are you can find in this paper and uh, more, more important, importantly, sorry, this uh, paper uh, enumerates some uh, provision that uh, a member said agreed to negotiate and discuss. And these are equity, and we know uh, how important equity, but not only equity, but access also, uh, but not only simple access, timely access. Uh, they also uh, uh, agreed to discuss health system strengthening. They also uh, dis uh, agreed to discuss issues like local production, uh, intellectual property issues, transfer of technology. They also agreed to discuss issues related to health workforce. And we heard this morning how much is important. Uh, One Health, we know how much is important. Uh, they also discussed, uh, agreed to discuss issues like research and development at national and global level, but also public uh, pandemic and public health literacy and infodemic. And of course, they also agreed to discuss uh, financing and how to finance prevention and preparedness. The, the negotiation will be starting in February and hopefully a uh, member state can, um, can come to agreement uh, that will be approved in 2024 uh, by the World Health Assembly. By the way, the two processes are aiming to give their conclusion to the same assembly and uh, it shows how much these two processes need to be coordinated to avoid duplication and contradiction. I will stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahjur. Um, very, very interesting, uh, particularly the necessity to learn about the lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic, your 10 proposals for the new global health um, architecture, and your analysis of the future uh, global pandemic treaty. Okay, now uh, we are moving to the next panel. Uh, what are the priorities for a pandemic treaty and the role of parliamentarians? We have a, an excellent table with uh, six uh, MPs and former MPs. I'm going to list them first and then to introduce them all together. Honorable uh, Aisha Mohammad El El Muller, thank you for being here. Uh, the Honorable Mariam Jashi, thank you for being here too. Uh, Nima Lugangira, thank you. Uh, Mari Rose. Uh, and Guinea Efa, and uh, Gisela Scaglia, and Andrew Allman. So, uh, Her Excellency uh, Aisha Muhammad El Mula is currently a member of the Federal National Council of the United Arab Emirates in the 17th legislative round since 14 November 2019. Uh, Aisha is a chairwoman of the Committee on Constitutional and Legislative Affairs and Appeals. She is also a member of the Committee on Social Affairs, Labor, Population and Human Resources, and Vice, Chair, um, Vice Chairwoman of the ASEAN Parliament, Friendship Committee, and member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Mediterranean. Her Excellency holds a bachelor's degree in political science and public administration from the United Arab Emirates University, and she also obtained an applied diploma on modern skills of female parliamentary work from the Center of Arab Parliamentary Diplomacy of the Arab Parliament, Arab Republic of Egypt. Um, Dr. Mariam Jaji is a senior level policymaker in global health, sustainable development, and innovative financing, bringing experience from 26 countries of Europe, Asia, Africa, and Middle East. She is a global board member of United Parliamentarians Network, Secretary General of Medical Women's International Association, and advisory board chair of Tbilisi Medical Academy. For eight years, 2012 to 
2020, she served as a high government official of Georgia, as a member of parliament, chair of parliamentary committee, and deputy minister of labor, health, and social affairs. Her earlier experience includes uh, 11 years of humanitarian and development work with UNICEF in charge of health programs and consultancy with UN agencies. Um, Dr. Shashi is a recipient of the HUA Award for Contribution uh, to Polio Eradication in Europe. Uh, Mason Fellow of Harvard Kennedy School, holds Master of Public Administration from Harvard University and a degree from the Yeti uh, Medical School, Master of Public Health also from Tbilisi State University. So let's uh, move to uh, Nima Lugahira. Uh, he's a member of Parliament in Tanzania who bring forward extensive experience and successful track record in championing, championing policy and legislative reforms for improved investment enabling environment for the agriculture, mining, oil and gas and health sectors, to mention, to mention a few. As a parliamentarian, her priorities include food and nutrition security, digital development, community health, gender equality in politics and NGO sector, government and development in Tanzania and across Africa. Okay. Um, thank you very much for being here. Uh, Mary Ross uh, in Guinea Afa is the president of the African Forum of Parliamentarians on Population and Development. And she is member of the National Assembly of Cameroon and representative of the Assembly to the Pan-African Parliament. She is also a member of the Cameroon France Friendship Group, chair the National Commission for the Fight Against HIV, AIDS, and Malaria and Tuberculosis, and vice chair of the Social, Cultural, and Familiar Affairs Committee. Thank you very much. Gisela Scaglia was a member of Parliament in Argentina for two periods, where she worked in legislation on environment, health, and children's rights. She has a long career in public administration at the local and national level in Argentina. Gisela now works as a consultant in, so in social development for different institutions promoting projects on global health and children's rights. Uh, she, has, she has been also professor of political science at different national universities for 15 years. Gisela was co-chair for Latin America of the Global TB Caucus and has been a member of UNITE since December 2018. Uh, last but not least, Honorable Professor uh, Andrew Oman uh, is in his second term as an elected member of the German Bundestag. He's a physician by training. Uh, Dr. Oman is a member of the Health Committee and serves as the spoken person on health of the Free Democratic Party Parliamentary Group. He's also the chair of the Subcommittee on Global Health of the German Bundestag and regional chair for Western and Central Europe of the Global Parliamentarians Network Unite. Uh, Professor Oman has a background in infectious diseases from Harvard Medical School and was trained in uh, hematology and oncology at the University of Mainz. He holds a full professor uh, of infectious diseases uh, at the Julius Maximilian University of Westburg, where he was also elected to the city council. Well, congratulations to the organizers for putting together an excellent panel, really. Congratulations to each panelist for your bios and in particular your careers. Uh, each of you has three minutes now to answer the following question. <laughs> you are going to kill me, right? Yeah, but what role do you think your national parliament should play in promoting a global pandemic treaty before it's signed during the negotiations in its formalization and in its uh, subsequent implementation? And what are, based on your experience, the most salient uh, priorities and issues that the global pandemic treaty should address? So uh, let's just start with, uh, Eaya Mohamed El Muda. Thank you. Uh, as a representative of PAM uh, in this session, I would reflect uh, PAM opinion about uh, the whole situation here. If you give me a chance to read the uh, thing, yeah. Uh, excellencies, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I would first like to thank Professor Juan uh, Diaz. Uh, and uh, for moderating our session uh, today, as well as organizers from UNITE, Honorable Ricardo Babist, Sahir Leti, and the Parliamentary Network of the World Bank, and IMF representative by Honor Liam Byrne. Uh, thank you for inviting the Parliamentary Assembly of the Mediterranean PAM 
to this event, and uh, it is an occasion for all uh, of us as parliamentarians to come together and voice our concerns as well as our support for the new initiative to be best fight pandemic and contagious diseases, the call for a global, globally or a global treaty. In the past couple of years, the world truly experienced that the pandemic, no, no geographical border, uh, borders, the COVID-19, it is virant, have jeopardized the social and economic situation worldwide. What have we learned? This is a question for all of us. We will all agree, cooperation is the key and speed uh, is of the essence. No single institution or government can address the, the, the threat of a future pandemic alone. The role of research labs uh, and the private sector has also been crucial in developing vaccines and uh, at the record base, they, they needed to be uh, encouraged and supported. But the pandemic exposed the realities of uh, sorry, discrepancies in the uh, purchasing power among nations. While richer countries had access to vaccines immediately, others had to wait for months, and some still do. To get shipment in that regard, we want th to thank the COVAX Gavi mechanism, which strived to ensure equi uh, equitable distribution of life saving vaccines globally. I want to stress another important point millions of doses of vaccines expired. We cannot let, these, let this happen again in the event of another pandemic. This goes against all of our values. As today, 42% of the WHO Eastern Mediterranean is fully vaccinated, but only five, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Kuwait, Iran, and Saudi Arabia, of the 22 member states have reached 70% of their population, which is the global goal of vaccinating. The vaccination rates vary hugely in the region from 99% in the United Arab Emirates, 81% in Italy, all the way down to 2.1 in Yemen and 13% in Syria. The numbers of death is, and disease and the conflict affected and vulnerable Communities grow faster compared to the other communities. Refugees and displaced people suffer the most in the lack of the adequate health as a system and, ba and basic services. It is essential to plan and implement the universal health coverage that targets vulnerable populations, especially during health emergencies where urgent measures must be applied uh, to mitigate the respiration. A, a global treaty would be legally binding under international law and agreement on pandemic prevention, pre uh, preparedness and response adopted under the WHO would enable countries around the globe to strengthen national, regional, and global capacities and reliance to the future pandemic. Such a, an instrument would enhance international cooperation in the field fields of surveillance alert and responses. So another question, so what we need? We need long-term political engagement at the highest level to work together to best pre uh, prepare for the future. Number two, we need political commitment to fund on the long-term pandemic prevention policies. Number three, we need to ensure that the scientific community can mobilize quickly and that the industry can also quickly deliver on the production of the vital medicine and vaccinations on time. Number four, we need to ensure universal and equitable access solution to health threats, including medicines and vaccines. There is another question that comes here. What can parliamentarian do? Yes. 
Number one, raise more awareness about the treaty proposal and national and uh, regional level, build a solid network of focal point in the countries and regions, call for increased budget to research and development, call for increased cooperation and all stages of a pandemic, design a recovery plan at international level to leave one on behind. In November 21, as you mentioned, uh, PAM and UNITE signed uh, at an official memorandum to, yeah, memorandum to understanding the encourage cooperation among parliaments and international organization. We stand ready to participate in relevant events and the uh, for the enhancement for more precious gift health worldwide. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Now is the turn of Mariam Shashi, please. Thank you, Professor. Distinguished delegates, colleagues, it's an honor to be participating um, in the session and addressing some of the most pressing and priority questions: how we can strengthen preparedness and response, uh, prevention preparedness and response for future pandemics. The list of lessons and uh, the experience that we have um, accumulated over the um, pandemic with this immense human tragedies and loss is extensive. And of course, uh, our time is limited to go through all those challenges, but let me highlight some of the key aspects and challenges that we have observed from the global health governance perspective. First of all, as uh, Professor Manjur rightly mentioned, there is a need for revision of the international health regulations because what we have seen at the country level was de jure implementation of IHR uh, international health regulations and mostly implementation of um, uh, of the recommendations remained uh, voluntary by the different countries. We have al also seen daily reporting of morbidity and mortality data during the tragedies of the COVID-19 pandemic, but the quality of data still remains questionable and we cannot do any decent retro or prospective analysis from those data. Third, the pandemic revealed not only fragility of national health systems, but fragility of democratic institutions, even in countries with long-term democracies. And even the Freedom House noted that in over 80 countries, the status of democracy and human rights deteriorated during the pandemic. Many countries, especially low and middle income countries, they have not engaged opposition political leaders or public health experts from different political parties in the discussions around the restriction measures. And in the name of fighting the pandemic, some of the measures were definitely not evidence-based and we've seen different levels of political manipulation, unfortunately, even during this crisis. So having observed all those uh, uh, experiences and lessons, we have to consider those challenges while designing the new global treaty for the pandemic pre preparedness, prevention and response, and to try to make our future pandemic responses more effective. First of all, what could be the role of parliamentarians? We can definitely bring the discussion of the treaty okay. after the independent negotiation body provides official draft for starting the negotiation to the parliaments. We have to facilitate nonpartisan discussions around the treaty. We have to make sure that every party represented as the um, representatives of the constituencies are present at least during the dialogue and discussions of the treaty. That can bring better ownership of the international instrument. We also have to ensure that we not only adopt a very nice, another comprehensive document and declaration adopted by almost 200 member states, but to really provide concrete tools and instruments to the countries how to implement those regulations. We still have a major gap in the global health inspectorate and independent monitoring instrument to ensure that countries' actions are monitored and they're not coming into political or 
collaborative conflict with WHO as the global health authority. We have to find a new public-private partnerships platform that can facilitate the global leaders to actually monitor and uh, positively um, like as, as a supportive supervision mechanism to our uh, national authorities. Finally, we have to make sure that we strengthen sustainability of WHO funding, and we have discussed this in the morning session in the Bundestag today. And uh, since we also have the presence of our dear colleague uh, from the UK, Elian, we can uh, empower WHO and empower implementation of the global health um, recommendations through linking the international financial institutions funding to the performance-based assessments, how they observe the global health regulations and recommendations. Definitely, we have much more to discuss, but uh, with the respect of time, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maria. Now is the term of Nima Lugangira, please. Um, thank you very much. As introduced, my name is Nima Lugangira, Member of Parliament from Tanzania, and I wish to recognize the presence of one of my mentors, Honorable Liam, and Chairperson of the Parliamentary Network on World Bank and IMF. Um, I continue to be grateful to Unite for extending the possibilities and platform for us parliamentarians from developing African countries to attend such global events. Um, I'm going to very quickly make six points. And the first one is the issue of capacity building for parliamentarians. We recognize during the pandemic, a lot of efforts and focus were geared towards health professionals. And it was the health professionals going around in communities, advocating different ways of protecting ourselves on COVID. But we forgot about the power parliamentarians have to distort everything that the health professionals are trying to say. And, 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 and that was clear with the anti-vax, the propagandas, et cetera. And, and to me, I saw that as a, as a, as a weak point on, on the global health stakeholders by not recognizing the power of parliamentarians. So one of the things that perhaps in this global um, pandemic treaty that is being proposed, we must be proactive in engaging parliamentarians and capacitating us to understand because I personally was hearing about a um, MNR vaccine, DNA vaccine, and when you don't have that capacity building, it's very easy for you not to get that clear understanding. And then you again go and communicate that to the people you're leading and cause a total confusion. So I think the first thing is we must recognize the importance of capacity building for parliamentarians. And in such events, parliamentarians are partners. In, 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 in the process, so that's number one. Number two, the global pandemic treaty, in my opinion, um, if it's not addressed, it can end up being a global North pandemic treaty that is then a directive for us from the global South to stick to. This is something that we have to be very candid about and very careful about. The global pandemic treaty should include us from global South in those discussions, because sometimes what works in Europe or in the US or in Canada or in Australia may not work in Africa. What works in South Africa may not work in Tanzania. So we need to all be part of this discussion so that we can ensure this global pandemic treaty is indeed a global pandemic treaty and not a one-sided pandemic treaty that then sends a directive to the rest of us to stick to. The third issue is, thank you. And anything that I say, blame it on Liam, because he taught me how to be candid. Um, the third point is um, improved response time. <laughs> improved response time. We saw during the pandemic, uh, global North countries kind of behaved a bit selfish took all the vaccines, made sure they were very well protected. It was only until later on that they came to realize, actually, if the rest of the world is not vaccined, you're not protected. Then suddenly, countries started offering us vaccines. But the issue is, 
we were getting vaccines with a very short shelf life. And in our countries, we don't have the mechanisms to transport these vaccines, to vaccine the people. A vaccine like Pfizer needs to be stored in minus degrees of I don't know what. We don't even have those kind of refrigerators in place, but we're getting those donations. So in a way, it was like, I felt it was just like Global North ticking a box, trying to kind of, um, you know, work on the ego that they're doing something, but actually they were not. So, so how can we ensure that in this global pandemic treaty, such behavior doesn't happen again? Because it was really unfortunate to experience such level of kind of selfishness. Meanwhile, we are together. And, and, and in a way, um, I think God somehow made the global north realize that you may have everything if all systems are not strong enough, you're not strong. So we need to find a way that this pandemic treaty can recognize all of these things and ensure that we are all actually safe. Um, fourth point very quickly is the issue of um, MPs, parliamentarians being part of the process from the beginning. It's very common and it can commonly happen, it's happened in previous things, that discussions are made and there will be, um, discussions will be engaged with governments, meaning the respective ministries, but not necessarily parliament. So discussions are made, a treaty is done, it's signed, and then all of a sudden, as parliamentarians, perhaps we're expected to use that document to champion it, to advocate for it. But we were not involved in the process. So we don't know how this started how it ended. And I think it's very important what we're doing here today to make sure that we are involved at the beginning of the process. But how can we now take this from global level to our national parliaments? How can we make sure that our ministries of health will engage us as parliamentarians? How can we make sure WHO will ask, have the local parliament, have the national parliaments been engaged? What is their opinion? Because oftentimes we're not engaged while we are representing the people and we understand the dynamics of, of the people that, that we represent. Um, fifth is the issue of digital health. During the pandemic, there was a huge effort on uh, making sure that, you know, we're recording number of people are being vaccinated, uh, reports are being sent, but for that to work effectively, we need digital inclusion. And in most of our countries, digital is still developing. So how can we strengthen digital health and link it also to pandemic um, preparedness? And that also requires financing. And this brings me to my last but one point is to implement this global pandemic treaty requires financing. For certain countries, it will be a, you know, a landslide. For a country like Tanzania and other developing countries, we will need financing. Will that financing be available? When will, when will it be available? Or are we going to find ourselves again at the same situation of privilege versus non-privilege? Non, non Finally, to conclude, um, is the issue of nutrition. I think if there was a period where nutrition became elevated and the power of food being medicine, it was during COVID. But how can we continue that, that, that recognition in everything that we're doing to also promote the importance of nutrition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Honor, uh, please, Mary Rose, it's your turn. So I think everything has, they all say everything, so. Um, I have a lot to say, but I think that I have a PowerPoint. I don't think I just tell you that uh, health has no party, no religion, no gender. COVID, uh, sorry, COVID-19 has brought down the world and turned the world order upside down. So parliamentarians have a key role in that they initiate law and control laws and control the government action. They are a sort of the beginning of the decision making, making process and in support of implementation of policy. They are therefore have opportunity 
to and the ability to tip the scale. Parliamentarians are local social actors. They are leaders and as such influencers. Parliamentarians have the central function of overseeing the response the response to pandemic as well as evaluating and diligently passing emergency legislation approving the national funds to meet the needs of their people. They can also promote transparency on national and global development around the pandemic, which is fundamental to maintain public confidence in the government's response to the pandemic. In this sense, they can also complete, complement their communication as far where possible to ensure that their constituency, constituency receive the necessary information. So multi-sectoral response to pandemic are necessary. Parliamentarians must collaborate, communicate, and share good practices. They must pull the data and the element in their possession because only joint intervention can respond to the threats that work on the health of our population. We must join forces and support the approach of One Health. Parliamentarians must share the question to the government, share the legislative proposal in line with the treaty or the international agreement, like you call. They need to repeal or amend national laws contrary to the treaty or the uh, international agreement. Streamline procedure and intervention during the during the crisis. As to finish, research funding. You are the one who vote the budget. The problem of um, patents. Should you keep the patents during the pandemic or not? Do, should you protect them or not? That is the real problem you have to 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 deal about. Um, they must, from the adoption of the treaty, uh, if the treaty is adopted, parliamentarians must do everything to ratify it in the parliament. So it will be applicable. They can also vote uh, budget lines sensitive to the treaty. They must raise awareness and make the treaty know why not translate it, translate it into the language so that the population are edified and take part of that? Parliamentarian most quite simply because ambassador of the world treaty and pandemic in order to fully play the role of spokesperson for the voiceless, legislator, controller, and protector of their population. So I think that the priority is networking more than ever you must be joined together and be united to do something together and thank you very much sorry. thank you thank you and stop that you used to say in my country that uh, in the north you have medicine and you have illness in the south yeah. so if you can stop that it will be better <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the Honorable Giselle Escaglia, please. Thank you, Juan de Dios. It's an honor to be here. Thank you, Ricardo, Liam. Uh, I will try to provide you uh, with the perspective of how we have experienced the pandemic in Latin America. I'm from Argentina. Uh, we are committed to creating a post-COVID area, uh, strong, sustainable, equal, and inclusive. Our path is to an and overcome the pandemic, and we have to model a world of strong economies, and health has a central relevance. The vaccine had a key role in the rebound of health and economy in the world. The financing of prevention, preparedness, and response should next time be more adequate and better coordinated and requires continued cooperation between health and finance decisions makers. We need to provide long-term solutions that ensure that all countries can financially afford the cost to face the next pandemic. We have suffered the consequences of inequalities during the pandemic. It was really hard to acknowledge the fact that many countries were able to offer a second dose of COVID-19 vaccines, while many countries of Latin America weren't even able to provide the 
first doses of COVID-19 vaccine. During the pandemic in my parliament, the Argentinian, we had to discuss a vaccine law reform because we needed to buy vaccines, but our law was not prepared to buy in the terms provided by the laboratories during the pandemic. Probably our experience could be a guide to know how we should be careful in a new treaty about the access of vaccines, medicines, or treatment, and also these regulations. We should include as a priority gender equality into the treaty. We have to take into account the specific needs of women and girls. Women and children were the most vulnerable populations during the pandemic. Women suffered the consequences of isolation. Most of them were in the front line of the medical system, but also they were responsible for the caregiving task. They suffered the consequences of a pandemic that deprived women of access to their routine medical checkups. They saw their rights restricted and women experienced increased violence against them. In my country, for example, the humanized delivery law was not a possibility because of the COVID restriction. The access to anticonception was restricted also. Nowadays, we can see an increase of many non-transmissible diseases such as breast cancer because of the absence of checkups for the two years or more. The violence against women in Latin America during the pandemic shows a rising number. Finally, the treaty needs to include two important principles, the right to health and the right to education. In the right to health, we should be responsible for three main ideas, universal access, physical health, and mental health. But as you notice, I just added the right to education also, because we cannot face the next pandemics without education, without the restriction to be educated. In my country, for example, for two years, the school were closed. The government tried to do virtual education, but was a mess. The gap between people with connectivity and access to technology and people without them was big. And this was a huge inequality that shouldn't happen anymore. To achieve these things, parliamentarians should be aware of their responsibilities. They should operate with their control mechanisms. The challenge, you know, is big, but, uh, but also uncertain. It is necessary to create the condition for health global actions to end and prevent infection diseases and to be prepared to respond to next pandemics. And I'm going to finish in Spanish, but with a song, a letter of song, hope, uh, color, or color esperanza, but the song says something like this. Sé que lo imposible se puede lograr, que la tristeza algún día se irá, que la vida cambia y cambiará. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Gisela. Now it's a, it's a turn of the Honorable Professor, Dr. Uh, Andrew Allman, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Excellencies, dear friends and colleagues. I was just hoping that Gisela would be singing, yes. uh, but, she, but she promised me she'll do this later. <laughs> we heard a lot of things today, and I think it's very obvious that COVID-19 has affected each and every one of us no region, no country has been spared. It's not an issue about North or South, West or East. And multiple experts already predict that COVID-19 will likely not be the last pandemic that we might experience. Therefore, as a politician, as we are all sitting here, we must seize the opportunity to strengthen global preparedness and response and to fill in the gaps that are obvious. But if not now, when then? We must act immediately to be prepared for future uh, health emergencies. A pandemic treaty can be a game changer in future diseases outbreaks, but only if it addresses the gaps in our current global system, we can be successful. Therefore, when designing it, it should always be examined under the criteria of our lessons learned, making sure that mechanisms actually address the deficiencies and errors uncovered in the course of this pandemic. Only when it addresses these, ga these gaps, a pandemic treaty can protect current and future generations from a global crisis worldwide, such as the COVID-19 pandemic occurring again. There are four major issues that I would like to address. First, compliance. A major gap in the current system is compliance. 
For a global agreement to be successful, we need accountability mechanisms to include transparency and monitoring mechanism. States need to share their information. For that a robust system of incentives, we needed such as a reputation of financial or uh, reputation or financial incentives. This is a critical point for countries. They determine how seriously to take normative instruments when they choose to include accountability me mechanisms. Second, equity. Equity is essential in any future pandemic treatment. We cannot repeat the same mistakes again. It is our moral, it is a moral fail failure not to realize equitable global access to COVID-19 vaccines. Tools against the disease should go where they are needed most. It's not only a question of humanity, it's also a question of responsibility. It is simple, a rational response to a disease outbreak. What we learned from COVID-19 pandemic is that we need to support countries to become more resilient. We need a, to increase production capacities. Germany has committed to support our partners to increase production capacities in order to become more independent. And what we also learned from the current health crisis is that we have to work on the logistics. Health, health system strengthening is a key global is the key for global health security and should be an integral part of the pandemic treaty. Countries need to have the capacity to react to health crisis. Another point which I want to raise when talking about equity, we need that we must take sure that gender and racial equity are prominently included into the pandemic instrument. That includes also handicapped and people for special needs. We all know the gender effects of COVID-19. Women have been hardly hit. They lost their job, lost their educational chances at a greater rate than men since 2020. Global trends of domestic violence have increased. Women's lost access to sexual and reproductive health services because they were deemed non-essential in the first waves of the pandemic. Against this backdrop, we need to make sure that principles of gender equity empowerment, participation, and inclusion are central to the content of the treaty. Third, information. We had a misinformation pandemic as well. Better information strategies are necessary. We need to empower people understanding science better. Resilience against misinformation are important issues that we have to raise and bring up to the attention of everybody worldwide. We need to bring them along with the issues that are occurring due to the pandemic, and we cannot leave anybody behind. Fourth, One Health. We must understand that One Health is, a, is highly misunderstood or not understood as of yet in the political world. We have zoonosis. We do uh, have to understand that diseases come from animals, can be carried on by animals, and carried to the human beings causing disease. In the past, we do under, we do recognize pandemics, uh, zoonosis, such as Ebola, HIV, even influenza is strictly taken a zoonosis. So there must be lessons learned from this pandemic that we switch animal health and human health together in the sense of one health. Any future pandemic treatment must be fully embody the vital lessons learned from the pandemic. To end, we have to use the momentum to update reforms to the health emergency preparedness and response framework that were long overdue. This is not a theory, it is reality. We cannot get off track even if times are difficult and headlines have shifted away from COVID-19 towards inflation, energy prices, and the war in Ukraine. We need sustained commitment and political leadership. We, as parliamentarians, cannot give up and our mission to build a healthier and safer world. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Congratulations for your commitment and your interventions. We are out of time, so I'm so sorry. We are not going to open the panel to Q&A. We are following with the next intervention. Uh, we invite to Barbara Stocking to come on stage.
uh, to kick off the next panel, how to prevent the next pandemic. We are going to reduce to the half your time. If you can do that, it will be amazing. And uh, please, thank you. Well, I don't want to speak this fast, or you'll never understand anything. But good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here, and thank you for inviting me. Now, how do we stop um, infectious disease outbreaks becoming pandemics? We know perfectly well, as um, Andrew has just said, that we are going to have outbreaks because we haven't yet got control of One Health. So we have outbreaks, but we can actually stop them becoming um, pandemics. And that's the vital part of all this. Now, what do we have to understand if we're going to do that? One of the things that it, that's very important indeed is that people just don't understand the exponential spread that happens with from outbreaks and into pandemics. And that means they don't take what we would call a precautionary approach to this whole thing. They wait and see. We saw that massively in February 2020 when WHO said, you know, we've got a fight and nobody did anything for a month. Now, this precautionary um, issue is quite tricky because if you prepare and you also act immediately, um, it's not clear to that actually when, you, when what happens is that you don't have a pandemic, that it was ever worthwhile doing that in the first place. Now, that's very difficult for governments to explain to their people that they've spent money on things that may not actually have been useful, or they, they probably suspect they have. Now, when I was thinking about this, I always remember, it's a, it's a joke I used to know in the health service about anaesthetists. When a patient gets into difficulties in, um, on the operating table, then this anaesthetist actually saves them and is praised you know, hugely. That's one thing. But then the good anaesthetist who never got them into difficulties in the first place has a very calm set of operations and nobody says anything of benefit to them. Now, it's a bit like what happens with this spending on, on the precautionary principle. But we have to we really have to understand that it really is so central to what we mean. But if we are moving then to say, well, what do we do? Um, well, of course, um, I think we pretty well know what from what's been said and what's in this room, a lot of the things we have to do. We have to have a good public health surveillance system. Um, we have to have that linked to the primary care workers right at the base of the, you know, of the communities um, and linked up to the whole health system. We've got to have good reporting systems. Um, we've got to have laboratories that can actually test um, what's going on, if at all possible. And we just have to have good public health knowledge and behavior of actually just um, where people have symptoms or an unknown disease that we do actually track um, all the people associated with them and and isolate. It is possible to control diseases so much more, you know, when we do the right things rather than, you know, sort of going off on some some other issues. But it's been pointing out the, the preparedness system absolutely needs financing. And it is it is fantastic that now we do have a fund that has been in, uh, really endorsed by governments uh, run by the World Bank um, and, and really up and running just in the last week, actually. But the point about that is it may have started running, but it's only got one point five billion so far committed to it. And uh, and the G20 workshop that worked on this said we need ten point five billion every year. So we've got a hell of a long way to go. Um, to get that. Um, but we also, um, if, if we're doing, we've talk, I've talked about prevention, but if we're doing outbreaks, as I said, we've got to get going very quickly. Even before we get a fight, we need early warning from WHO that actually says which countries need to abide by what and get on with it. And there is no time to wait. And in all of this, as several people have mentioned, we have to have accountability of countries. Um, we know that throughout this 21st century, countries have not responded when WHO has recommended, advised, or, or even really required countries to act in particular ways. And that is just not going to work. Basically, if we don't have accountability, we have no point in doing all this work on getting a pandemic treaty. It just has no meaning if we can't hold people to account for that. Um, now, my the panel that I represent, trying to work for a public health, um, well, a, a pandemic convention, really, um, uh, we've, we've come to the conclusion that we really do need a small independent body that can look at the evidence, both on preparedness, 
thoroughly, but also the evidence as response is taken, because we have to act very fast at that point to find out what countries are doing and persuade them to actually do the right things at that stage. So we need, um, no, I can see we've, I'm already being looked at. Um, <laughs> so quickly, how can parliamentarians help? I think you've said it all. Uh, we need parliamentarians in, involved from right now, really understanding more about what this treaty is all about, and then being really active in making sure that this treaty is ratified by their government. And apart from being a good thing, why do we want that? We want that because once you've got ratification, then you as parliamentarians can ask questions in your parliaments all the time about why your government did not act on the thing that it was signed up to do. And it's not just parliamentarians, it is the whole of civil society in your, in your countries can then take that and say, come on, you said you were going to do this, where is it? So this is about accountability to the people, not just somehow up the line, that's really, really important um, and if we can't do that, then frankly, I think we've we've really let down our publics. So um, I'd really encourage the parliamentarians to absolutely go for it. We need you to do this. So thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. We need to finish at uh, 3.30. So I invite to Naomi Borgshine just to send a message about how civil society and, and governments and, and parliamentarians and the scientific community can work together. Just a message and then we close. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. I'll deliver that in haiku form this afternoon. <laughs> Thank you, Ricardo, honorable parliamentarians. Um, I'm Naomi Berkshire. I'm the executive director of Harm Reduction International. Um, and we are passionately involved and committed in participating in the pandemic treaty because we work primarily on, on drug policy. We know under the drug policy conventions, we're sitting with a set of conventions that are problematic for us all day, every day in countries around the world. We know that they were drafted in closed corridors um, in the United States 60 years ago, and they're not fit for purpose. Additionally, we know that over the course of the years of the implementation of the pandemic of the, the drug control conventions, that the, the creep of security and law enforcement has been interpreted to be a larger and larger part of it. The major lessons from COVID-19 were that civil society and community stepped up and filled the gaps in state services that were absolutely essential to maintaining services around the world. Um, Rosemary Mbura from Wacky Africa said this morning, community health workers were the guardians of our continent. And that stuck with me. I thought that was beautiful. Um, and the Lancet Commission for, Len for Lessons on COVID also said strong public health systems should include strong relationships with local community and civil society organizations. And so our suggestions for parliamentarians and for governments around the world are consistent with the general obligations already written into the wording of the draft text of the treaty, but it really needs backup. It really needs ongoing advocacy to make sure we get there. We need renewed en energy to strengthening space for the genuine participation of civil society and community. And you know, there's a real parallel here because there are governments from the Global South primarily, sitting in Geneva who don't have the resources to be at the World Health Assembly, to negotiate a pandemic treaty, to also be on IHR, as well as all the other things going on at the same time. Genuine participation means getting your documents into you weeks ahead of time, it means translation, it means getting the capacity that our parliamentarians talked about. The pandemic treaty also includes a section on governance for the, the draft text for the implementation of the pandemic treaty. And we need to see within that draft text um, assurances that the national pandemic preparedness working groups also seek civil society and community participation because without drawing those lessons into our processes, we're going to repeat the mistakes of the past. Thank you so much to the Parliamentarians Network, prioritizing health and rights. Thank you very much, Naomi. Uh, we are going to close at uh, the workshop with the presence of Dr. Uh, Jawad Makhshur. You are invited to come here. And of course, Ricardo Baptista later. Thank you very much. I, I think the message is clear. We have a lot of work ahead of us uh, and the role of parliamentarians is critical. Uh, and so we have very strong public health, uh, political leaders uh, uh, here, but also across the world committed to doing exactly what all of our speakers have mentioned. And I think that the remarks coming from uh, Barbara and then Naomi as civil society 
really struck a chord on the importance of making sure that we are serving the people's interests. And it really resonated, I think, with everyone in the room from different perspectives that we need to make sure that this pandemic treaty convention, legal binding agreement is not negotiated in corridors and then imposed on the people, but actually something built from the people for the people. And I think this is a huge opportunity for us to work together with the World Health Organization and together to achieve this ambitious goal. I pass the floor to my dear friend from WHO. No, three things. Just to start by uh, saying that I took note of every single word said by the parliamentarians. I will report to the INB Bureau on this discussion and uh, your concern as well. Second, if you wish to follow the discussion on the INB, please consult regularly the uh, web, sit web. Uh, is uh, www.inb.who.int. And uh, second is I will propose that the Bureau of the INB to meet with UNITE and to continue the discussion. And I'm sure that from discussion, uh, we can move much better forward. Thank you very much again for inviting WHO and uh, wish UNITE all success. Bye-bye.